Hey folks, Edder from Brain Pulp TV, and I'm back with more Magic Online, only this time I'm doing something a bit different. If you've seen me play Magic Online in the past, it's always been limited play. It's either been a draft or some sort of sealed league or something like that, and you get to see the draft or me do the deck building with the sealed league, and then I show you the matches, and that's pretty much the only type of Magic Online I've shown on the channel. This time it's going to be constructed play, and it's going to be popper constructed play as well too. Now, there are a couple reasons why I'm doing this video. The lesser of the two reasons is the fact that there was no Mana Cave this last Friday. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the Mana Cave, it's where we play live paper magic, we record it, and then we release those games as sort of gameplay videos on the channel every single Friday. However, we have shot two new episodes, but the first of which was not edited in time to get out this last Friday. So this coming Friday, there's going to be a new episode, and then hopefully... By then, we'll sort of caught up on our filming schedule, and there'll be new episodes every single Friday from then on. However, that's not the case this time, so I did want to get some sort of gameplay video out to you guys. Thus, one of the reasons why I'm doing this. However, the larger of the two reasons why I'm doing this video is because I've recently released a deck tech on the channel earlier this week for a pop -a brew I called the Flight of the Godhead deck. Now, if you're anything like me, when you build a deck, that's not usually the end of it. You're constantly tinkering with it, either when new sets come out or just when you get new ideas or when you have a matchup and you realize, wow, this deck is really, really weak against something in my opponent's deck, and maybe I can do something to improve that. You're never going to be able to necessarily get an answer to everything, but you want to try to get as close to that as possible with Constructed. So that sort of left me wondering how I can let you guys know about changes I've made to a certain deck once I've done a deck tech, because I didn't want to have to do a new deck tech every single time for the same deck if I'm only changing out one or two cards. So instead, I thought, I will show you some of the games that I've played with this deck, and then I'll break down at the end of it the changes that I'm thinking of making based on my victories as well as my losses. Speaking of victories and losses, this video is going to show you two of each. Two games that I managed to win, and two games that I got absolutely crushed in because those I think are gonna be both very good tools as far as learning what I can improve with the deck and what's working with the deck. Now, if you haven't checked out the deck tech video for this deck, I will briefly explain what this deck is about, but for a deeper explanation, a, I'll put up a link that will take you to that deck tech. Now, just as a quick rundown of what this deck is all about, it's it's based around this card here, Steel of the Godhead, which gives a buffs to white creatures and to blue creatures. So this deck, the idea behind it is to play a bunch of creatures that are both, both white and blue, so it can benefit from both of the uh, bonuses that Steel of the Godhead provides. As well, too, it runs cards like the Thistledown Duel, which in and of itself also benefits from white and blue spells being cast. And there's just a bunch of white and blue spells in this deck that will aid the Thistledown Duel and also sort of pump up the other creatures and give them certain benefits. And being a white and blue deck, it also contains a bunch of other cards you've probably seen in white and blue decks if you ever played Popper before, like Oblivion Ring or Mole Drifter or uh, Counterspell and Preordain. So yeah, this is not exactly a super, super aggressive deck because it actually has a slower mana base, a lot of which the cards will come into play tapped. However, by turn three, this deck can really start taking off. And because of Steel the Godhead's ability to give creatures lifelink and make them unblockable, you can sort of play catch up usually by turn three if you're playing against a deck that is more aggressive than you. Now, I'm not going to lie, this deck is not a tier one deck. It's not a tier two deck. It's probably not even a tier three deck. It's more of a fun deck. However, I do get a lot of fun out of winning. So I also don't want it to be a pushover. I want it to be the best deck that I can possibly make it, despite the fact that it's not a super, super competitive deck. I still want to be competitive with it. So we're going to get into the games now. We're going to see how I did in both my wins and losses. And at the end of this, I'm going to do sort of a postmortem and figure out the cards that I may want to put into the deck, take out change the numbers of or tweak in some sort of way, just generally what I can do to make it better. So without further ado, let's get into the first game right now. Okay, now with this first game, as you can see, I did not start with a very strong opening hand, so I do end up mulliganing this hand here, and I get something that's much better, not super, super great, but much better. I do have the Esper Stormblade, which in my deck tech for this deck, I mentioned that if you can start off with either the Stormblade or the uh, Sure Blade, you are sort of off to a good start. We also have Steel the Godhead, which is exactly one of the cards that you want to get out as soon as possible with this deck. We have a Plains, a Lonely Sandbar, and the Chancery here. Now the Chancery will send back one of the lands. So at the beginning of this, 
I typically will play a card that won't, or a land that won't come into play tap, because I want to be able to play the Chancery and then send out another card the following turn that will come into play untapped. So the Lonely Sandbar is going to sit in my hand for a little while yet. Now we do get to scry, we scry up one of the other copies of Steel the Godhead. Now, a lot of the time I will actually keep this card on the top of my deck. This time I decided not to, simply because I wanted to sort of get another creature that I could play fairly quickly, and I already have one of the copies of Steel the Godhead. It was sort of a tough decision, but in the end I decided to put it on the bottom and hope for maybe another creature instead. But a lot of the times, if I see this, I will actually keep this on the top of the deck. Okay, so... Nothing super exciting at the beginning. We do see a mountain from our opponent, so immediately I'm expecting lightning bolts galore. And this is sort of the reason why I threw back the Steel of Godhead. I did want to get another creature. So I am kind of glad now that I did do that because I'm expecting lightning bolts, I'm expecting removal, and it's nice to be able to have a couple creatures that I'll be able to play fairly soon in the game. So as I mentioned before, I played the planes. I don't have anything that I can sort of tap it to get its mana before I send out the Chancery, but still, I'm, I'm sending it out there. So turn three, I'll be able to have enough mana to cast either the Sure Blade or the Storm Blade. So let's keep moving on and we'll see my first turn. We get a copy of Wings of Hope, which is a nice card to have. And especially as I mentioned in uh, the deck tech, this immediately puts any creature you have, regardless of whether it gains a bonus from Multicolored Permanent, out of lightning bolt range. So this is a nice card to have drawn against this matchup where I'm assuming lightning bolts are gonna be played. So here I play out the storm blade. Now, a lot of the time in the token creation, it's gonna be creatures that are on the ground. So I would rather have the Esper storm blade, which can get flying whenever a another multicolored permanent comes on there. So even though steel the Godhead makes it unblockable, if I'm not gonna, if I'm not gonna be able to put the Godhead on this, I want this creature to be able to fly instead of simply having first strike. So that's one of the reasons why I played the Stormblade first. Okay, so we're just gonna move on to our opponent's turn and here they're going to tap two lands and initially I'm gonna think that they're playing something that creates tokens, but instead it's something much, wor much worse for us. It is another copy of Impact Tremor. So now every time a creature enters the battlefield, we're gonna take two damage. So I'm really, really glad we have a copy of Steel of the Godhead in our hand because that's going to be hopefully able to allow us to recoup some life, which we're no doubt going to start losing right away on our opponent's next turn. So here I think I just go ahead and play out Steel of the Godhead on the Esper Stormblade. Yes, I do. And they... They crack the revolving wild to get another mountain. So now it is a 5-4 flying lifelinker that can't be blocked. And I do get to swing in uh, without any sort of blockers. And even if there was, once again, unblockable. So we're going to gain 5 life. They're going to take 5 life. I'm feeling pretty good about how things are going so far. Now this is exactly why I don't like red decks. Sorry, I kind of zoomed through that pretty quickly. But they cast lightning bolt. Now, I'm assuming that they didn't cast lightning bolt because they're really, really bad at math. So I'm expecting a second lightning bolt, and I was almost correct, it's a copy of Shock. The good thing is it required them to spend two cards in order to get rid of the Stormblade, and we do still have another creature, as well as some card draw, and something that can then buff up the Bant Shurblade, even though it's not a uh, Steel of the Godhead. It's still something I'm going to be able to buff up the Shurblade with, and I'm going to be able to do it the turn it comes into play, once again putting the Shurblade out of um, lightning bolt range. I'm also hoping that this means that they're not going to be able to cast anything. They only got three cards left in hand. I'm not so lucky. And we have Dragon Fodder. Create two red goblin tokens. They're going to hit the board and I'm going to take four. So now they have two 1-1 one -one creatures on the board and I'm taking four just because they came in. So the life we gained has already been cut down to just one. Got super lucky with catching another copy of Steel of the Godhead off the top of the deck. So I'm Really, really grateful for that. Here we're going to cast the Sure Blade, and I believe I cast Wings of Hope on it right away. Yes, I do want to put it out of uh, Lightning Bolt range. So now it's a no life gain, but it is a four or five flying first striker. Gathered the towns, folks. So once again, they're going to be creating two tokens. This time, however, it's going to be humans. Not that it makes a difference. I'm going to be taking another four damage simply from them hitting the board. They now have four 1 1 tokens. And even though I can easily eat one of their tokens, they're probably going to, I'm expecting them to adopt a very aggressive strategy now and just start swinging in because I just don't have the blockers to cover a wide board. They don't swing in here, right in here, which 
does sort of make sense because it only means one extra point of damage, but I am expecting a flood on, the, on their side of the board and then to start swinging in. However, we do get to cast our second copy of Steel the Godhead, which is going to make a huge difference for us. We also get to have two lands up. Not that it makes any difference because we don't have anything that we're going to use those two lands for, but we have a decent amount of land up. We have Muldrifter next turn and we can cast it. We can hard cast it for its full uh, ability, not just its evoke. So we're going to have a 2-2 two -two flyer and get to draw two cards next turn. So pretty happy about the extra land. Even though at this point is going to leave us empty, we are going to get two cards next turn. So everything seems to be going our way. And now we're going to swing in for six points of damage uh, and we're going to gain six life. So they're down to nine, which is great. So I'm thinking this is going to be over super, super quick. And then they play Dragon Fodder again. We're going to take another four. Sucks, but I wasn't, you know, surprised by that. And they're going to swing in for four, another four. So luckily we've been gaining all this life because if not, we would be in very, very dire straits right now. So here we go ahead and we're going to swing in, putting them down to three, play our Mole Drifter. And at this point, I believe they had a scoop. Yes, they do scoop. So we were able to win a game against a uh, Impact Tremors deck that had the removal and they had a very, very strong opening hand. They had two copies of Impact, Impact Tremors. They had two bits of their removal. They had all the lands they needed and they had two copies of Dragon Fodder and Gather the Townsfolk. So for the most part, their deck started off as strong as it possibly could. Our deck started off really well as well too. And we were able to get this victory fairly easily, not, not to take away from the opponent because I, I really like this deck that they're playing and this type of deck has beaten me in the past uh, when I've been using other decks. So this deck did very well against this deck. And on the surface, you would think, oh, so everything's working perfectly and there's no changes needed to be made in this deck because you just win with it. Not true. We're going to get into another game, which I did win, but it's going to start showing some of the cracks in this deck. Okay, so here we are in the next game. Now, I'm going to spoil things a little bit for you. I've already mentioned that I win this game. However, we're going to be playing against a Tron deck. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to show this game is because, like I mentioned at the end of the last game, this game starts to show a couple of cracks in our deck. But this is also a deck, the, our opponent here, Pogo, is playing a deck that I actually quite like and I've wanted to build for quite a while. I do want to build both a Tron Popper deck as well as a Tron Modern deck. So... I wanted to play against a deck or show you a deck that I actually like the build of uh, for, you know, that reason as well, too. But mostly it's to show a couple of small cracks in this deck that show up with this game. Now, as we can see here, we start off with a pretty decent opening hand. We have uh, all the land we should need. We have two lands that don't come into play tapped. And then we have the uh, Chancery, which will be able to come in on turn two. And we've got two of the Zealous Guardians. So we're going to be able to get a couple creatures out. At this point, obviously, I don't know what we're playing against. But uh, I'm still feeling pretty good because we have Deputy of Acquittals. We can bring out on turn two as well, too. And we have the card draw with Muldrifter. And that's only if we're not able to catch a fifth land and play it for its 2-2 uh, for its two -two flying body as well, too, on top of its card draw. Because we do currently have four mana that we'll be able to have out there and it's only going to cost us one more to hard or hard cast to fully cast the mole drifter so now let's zoom ahead and see how our opponent does our opponent decides to keep their opening hand as well so they're starting off we don't do anything super exciting i play the island i'm not going to play one of the zealous guardians yet i'm going to flash that out at the end of their turn now a second i see the urza's tower you pretty much know what to expect at that point you know it's going to be tron you know it's going to be something where they're going to want to have a ton of mana to cast stuff. I'm not sure exactly what type of Tron deck it's going to be, but you'll find out soon enough. And uh, so we're just going to zoom ahead. And as well, too, they also start off with an expedition map, which for this deck is huge. Now, if they have one of the other two uh, Urza lands in their hand, they're going to be able to now grab the second one for sure on their second turn, completing the group of Urza's lands, giving them a ton of mana and putting them off on the uh, the right foot right at the beginning of the game. So we move to their end step and I do flash out one of the Zealous Guardians because there's no reason not to. I'm not super worried about something like uh, Chainer's Edict or anything like this with this deck right now. I don't know what other color they'd be playing. Usually they play something that can either uh, filter uh, mana to create any color, but I still want to get the Guardians out because I'm expecting to only have a little bit limited time before they start playing some sort of either crazy 
expensive combo or really big creatures that are going to just sort of like overrun us and kill us dead. So I do play the Zealous Guardian. And here, I think I play the second Zealous Guardian. Yeah, I tap it, play the second Zealous Guardian on my turn because I want to be able to get the, the chance to out and I'm going to have to send this land back to my hand to do it. Okay, now, before we go on any further, we, cut, we catch a counter spell here. Now, I want you to notice what this counter spell does for us for a long portion of the beginning of this game. During the deck tech for this, I mentioned that I never really found it to be too difficult to hold up two blue to cast this card during, I think I actually referred to it as this FU for two blue or something like that. Um, I'm beginning to think that might not have been the most accurate assessment of this deck. And you'll sort of see in the early parts of this game as to why either I may want to change up my mana mix or go with less tap lands or switch out for something other than counterspell. So here they do. They, they get to crack the expedition map. So they're going to grab the last of the Urza cycle. And they did have another one of the Urza lands in their hand. Okay, so here we catch Shielding Plaques, which is not exactly the card that I would want. I would prefer one of the either Wings of Hope or obviously God, uh, Steel of the Godhead to buff up one of these creatures. But still, Shielding Plaques is good because I can get... I don't know what type of removal they have. So putting this out there might at least sort of prep one of these creatures so that I don't have to worry about them being able to target the creature itself. Here though, I'm going to draw a couple cards because I would much rather have, like I mentioned before, either Steel of the Godhead or um, uh, Wings of Hope. So I swing in first and then I'm gonna go ahead and evoke the Mole Drifter. So I <laughs> draw the second copy of Shielding Plaques, uh, but I also get to draw the Bant Sure Blade. So I'm not, Unhappy with the number of creatures we have in this, we will be able to survive a few rounds of removal and uh, get some better creatures out there for sure uh, fairly soon. Still, would much rather have Wings of Hope or Steel of the Godhead. Now, they're going to, not surprisingly, play the third of their Urza lands and a Prismatic lands, which, as I mentioned before, these types of decks a lot of time will have artifacts which will filter so that they can create a specific color of uh, mana. And here they have their own Mole Drifter. But uh, unlike with me, they get to actually cast their Mole Drifter and they now have a 2-2 Flyer and get to draw two cards. This is one of the great things that I really enjoy about the Tron decks is the, uh, especially if you if you catch the, the land draw like they did, um, you can start casting some great stuff really early on because it's still only turn, th turn three and they have a Mole Drifter out on the board. So they've got seven cards in hand. They're all tapped out, which means I don't have to worry about any sort of shenanigans on my turn this turn, but they're still off to a really, really good start. So I get a nice bit of luck by catching Steel of the Godhead, so I'm super happy about that. However, I think here, and I'm going to quickly go ahead to see if I am right about this. I make some indecisive uh, land tapping there. Okay, so I bring, bring Bant Sureblade out. Now, I wasn't sure if I was prepping one of these with uh, Shielding Plaques. I'm not in a super hurry right now. Knowing what type of deck this is, I know I still have a little bit of time before they're going to start being able to cast whatever either combo or giant creature they want. So I'm not super, super worried. However, once again, I've got a counter spell here, don't have the mana to cast it, and I couldn't really keep up the mana to cast it because of the way that uh, uh, the Chancery uh, taps for both a white and blue. So in order to keep up for Counterspell, I would have had to keep an island and this up. So basically, I would have had to keep three men up for the one Counterspell. So instead, I bring out the Bant Sureblight. Once again, this is this is something which is really making me question either my mana base or whether or not Counterspell is the right card to have in this deck. So Shimmering Grotto, um, they can add one of any color to their pool again, and also another Expedition map. So they're going to be able to grab a, another one of probably the towers, and I believe it is going to end up being the tower that they grab with Expedition map. And they can crack it right away as well, too. So they do end up grabbing one. You can't see it because the, the chat window is not open, but they do end up grabbing the uh, tower. So that kind of sucks for us because I know that they're really going to start going off fairly, fairly soon. And they get to cast another Mole Drifter for uh, both its body and its card draw. So they're at eight cards. They actually have to discard a card. That's how well they're doing. 
So at the end of the turn, I simply flash out Deputy of Acquittals. Not for its extra value or anything like that where I can bring one of my creatures back, simply because I'm expecting something big, so I want to get as many of my creatures out on the board as possible. I also don't want to have to hold up mana because I want to be able to cast Steal the Godhead and uh, possibly Shielding Plax if I'm able to uh, to catch another land. I'll still be short of, of one land to do both next turn, but I may decide, I think I decide to actually prep one of my creatures first before I end up casting Steal the Godhead on it. Now, they discard a uh, Seagate Oracle, which I wouldn't be too worried about anyways, uh, facing off this deck. We do get the, the Chancery, which is great for us, because it means that we're going to be able to start having uh, enough up to cast Shielding Plaques and Steal the Godhead at the same time. At the same time, on the same turn. So here I do decide to be a bit cautious and cast Shielding Plaques because I do want to protect this creature uh, or the Bant Sherblade as, as much as possible. Also, uh, Shielding Plaques draws a card, which is always nice, so I get to get a bit of extra card draw. And we catch a Stormblade. So we're doing well for creatures, though, once again, I know something big is coming down the pipe for my op from my opponent. Uh, we get to do the, the Chancery. So next turn, I'll be able to cast the Stormblade if I want, as well as uh, Steal the Godhead. So we're doing okay. Once again, though, for the third or fourth turn in a row, I can't hold up for Counterspell because of the way that my mana is going and, and because of the cost of Counterspell. So... Once again, it's making me question whether Counterspell is the best card for this deck or or if the mana base is, is built for a card like Counterspell to be in the deck. So the Fangren Marauder, I'm not super worried about. It's a 5-5 five, five body, which obviously sucks, and they got two 2-2 two, two flyers in the air as well too, but I'm not super worried about this because I do know I have certain removal in the deck, and I'm thinking that I'm going to be able to start outracing them as far as they're going to be able to do a certain amount of damage, but I'm going to be gaining so much more life from uh, from my creature, one of my creatures at least, very, very soon. And there's some that got edited out when I just dumped Diet Pepsi all over myself because apparently I don't know how to drink from a can properly. Anyways, we're going to keep moving on. They cast Prophetic Prism, so they get a bit of card. I mean, they're, they've got five cards in hand. So do we as well, too. So it's not like we're hurting for, for cards in our hand, but uh, I'm way more worried about them now. I was actually very surprised that they have this card in this deck. I wasn't expecting Chainer's Edict in this deck. I, I don't know why, but I don't think I normally see this card in Tron decks. I could be wrong. Maybe it's just my lack of experience of playing against Tron decks. But even then, it's not really doing much for our board, right? Like it's or to our board because we have two Zealous Guardians, which would be the easy first pick to to um, sacrifice to Edict. Now, granted. They do have easy access to enough mana to flash it back on another turn, but still, it costs seven. It costs seven to flash back and two black, so it's, it, it's, it is going to tax their mana base to flash this back out. But once again, we have a, another creature in our hand, so getting rid of one of our creatures is not a huge concern for us. So yes, here I decide to get rid of one of these Zealous Guardians, which shouldn't surprise anyone. And they don't swing in, which is... A bit surprising because I really don't have anything that can stop the flyers, but I, I guess to them it made sense. Um, didn't really make sense to me, but whatever. And now we're able to get Steel of the Godhead out, and it's created a 5-4 uh, flying lifelinker that can't be blocked. So I'm pretty happy about this because we're going to start gaining life and swing in for a ton, which they can't do anything about. Now here I actually hold up Counterspell. It's the first time I've been able to hold up for Counterspell without sacrificing, uh, casting something of value. So, and even then I am holding up three potential mana to cast a two mana spell. So I keep saying it, but th that's the whole point of me showing you this particular game is the fact that it's making me question whether Counterspell is the best fit for this deck. So they cast Ancient Stirrings. Now, they are going to grab uh, Ulamog's Crusher uh, from, their, from their deck. So immediately, I'm happy that I held up for Counterspell. Uh, then they start tapping for a ton of mana. And I can see it going down, and boom, there it is, Ulamog's Crusher. So this is the type of Tron deck that we're dealing with, not the combo one, which I actually prefer because the combo ones annoy me. 
Um, I don't mind playing against them. Like, you know, I think people should be able to do like their own thing when it comes to the decks. But the times where I played combo decks, the games have gone long and half the time they go through their combo and then concede at the end of it. So because they haven't hit it, that does not make a fun magic game. So I'm actually happier that it's a uh, crusher because not just because I'm able to deal with it right now, though there is that, but because I find this to be a more interactive style of deck than a combo-y sort of uh, Tron deck. So they cast the crusher and I crush the crusher with my counter spell. Ca spending three mana to do it, which is not ideal. So it once again makes me question whether or not counter spell is the best uh, counter spell for this deck. Catch another Bant Shurblade, which is which is fine uh, because we're we now have a Stormblade and a Bant Shurblade. I'm going to now get to filter. This is one of the things that I I I, I changed from the time of the deck tech. I actually mentioned this at the end of the deck tech or near the end of the deck tech that I added to Halimar Depths to the deck. I don't find that adding these have hindered me in any way. So I'm probably going to keep Halimar Depths in the deck, but I may actually change my mana base a little bit to compensate for it. I took out a Island and a Plains in order to make room for two Halimar Depths. I'm probably going to actually take out, um, put an Island back and take out at least one more Plains, if not a couple more Plains and replace them with Islands. Anyways, Halimar Depths comes into play, so we get to see the top three cards of our hand, and I'm thrilled. I'm super thrilled. Steal the Godhead, Lonely Sandbar, Counterspell. We also have Shielding Plaques, so if I want to, I can put whatever card I want to have in my hand right away and cast Shielding Plaques and draw that card. So I believe that's what I end up doing here. And I put them back in order of Lonely Sandbar, uh, Counterspell, and then Steal of the Godhead. So here I go ahead and cast the Plaques, uh, draw the Steal of the Godhead, and then I still have three mana up to cast Steal of the Godhead. Of course, I put it on Deputy of the Acquittals because I don't have the extra mana to bring either another Sure Blade or another Storm Blade out. So here comes Steel of the Godhead, and it's going to be on the Deputy of Acquittals, making it a 4 4. So we now have a 5 4 uh, First Strike, Unblockable Lifelinker, and a 4 floor, uh, 4 4 Lifelinker that can't be blocked. I swing them both, bring them down to 3. And then on their turn, I believe they scoop. Yes. So once again, this is a win for us as far as the deck goes. However, as I mentioned uh, throughout the video, it's really shown that Counterspell either needs to probably change, which I'm so annoyed with because I, I just prefer Counterspell. It's so simple. It's just there's no conditions to it. If you have the two blue, you can cast it. But with this deck, Having two reliable blue out that you can hold up is proving to be more difficult the more I play with this deck. Maybe I was just getting uh, lucky early on in my testing, I don't know, but I'm really sort of moving away from the idea of having counter spells in this deck, or I'm going to have to sort of change my mana base, like I said, to maybe add in more islands and maybe take out some more planes. However, those are two wins that we had, and you can only learn so much from wins. So now let's look at some really really bad beats that i not bad in the sense that it was like oh i like you know i just got unlucky i just got beat i got beat like i owed my opponent money so we're gonna go to the first one of my losses not the first loss ever but the first of the losses that i'm gonna show you right now okay so here we are in the game now it should also be noted that i won the first game of this match however this is the second game of the uh of this match and i start off with a very poor opening hand so i do have to mulligan which you know, I'm not, I'm definitely not saying that the mulligan is what cost me this game. So I do end up mulliganing, uh, which is a really weird word to say. And I end up with a much better opening hand, but not the best opening hand, because I don't really have a creature. I have two copies of Steel of the Godhead, which is great. I have Shielding Plaques, which is also great. But the other card is a Mole Drifter, and I'm not really going to be able to cast that as a creature anytime soon. I do end up keeping this, though. And I get very lucky with getting a Esper Stormblade. So I'm super happy about that. And uh, it means that I'm going to probably be able to cast a creature, maybe not with this mana base on turn two, but definitely on turn three. Now, my opponent's deck is a deck, once again, that I played against with Travis. I believe it's referred to as the Aristocrats style deck. And uh, they start off strong. They start off with a Mortician Beetle. So that is sort of like the new key to this deck, and uh, at least in the popper uh, format of it. And immediately I'm worried because I realize I don't have the worst 
hand right now with the the, the uh, Esper Stormblade coming out, but it may not be quick enough to deal with this deck. So we're going to cast the island because that's literally all I can do here. And then they get a Karen Feeder, which also sucks for us. And then they get a Young Wolf, which is even worse for us. So they immediately <laughs> sack the Young Wolf, allowing them to put both a counter on the Karen Feeder and the Mortician Beetle. And I'm I'm getting that that sense of dread that when you know, even though it's only like the beginning of turn two, that you are just you are just bound to lose this game. So they're swinging in for two. Okay, not the end of the world because once again we have two copies of uh, Steel of the Godhead, and now we have two Esper Stormblades and two copies of Steel of the Godhead, and we can even sort of protect them a bit with shielding plaques. We're not doing too too bad as far as our hand goes. So I can't really complain, even though I didn't have to mulligan. I can't really complain that we're starting off with a super, super bad draw. This would normally be a very strong uh, hand for us. So we do have to send the island back uh, with putting the Chancery out there, but we're going to be able to play something next turn, which is great, right? Only problem is they have Rancor in hand as well, too. Why wouldn't they? Everything else has been working out for them. So they have uh, right now eight damage potential, potentially eight damage on the board, which I can't answer. I can't answer at all. And then they get the uh, Blood Throne Vampire out as well, too. They have one card left in hand. So their opening hand was nuts. It was really, really good. Um, but once again, our opening hand wasn't the worst that we could ever hope for. But with a deck like theirs, you cannot fall behind in a deck like theirs or because you just get run over. So... They have uh, pretty much everything they could ever want, uh, especially with this Rancor, because once again, if you can if you can deal with the creature that Rancor is on, they still get to keep Rancor. So, yeah, they're going to swing in here for eight after swinging in for two. So we're down to ten. We're down to ten, and it's uh, turn three. And then we get, they also end up, uh, I guess they decided, you know, I, I'm doing so well, I don't really need the vampire and I don't blame them honestly I I would much rather have an extra counter on Karen feeder and on uh, mortician beetle as well too so that makes sense that they decided to sack that at the end of their turn I think it was a little um premature to do before they actually saw what I was going to do but they're pretty secure in in what they're in what they're doing so uh now they have lethal now they have lethal on the board and once again I'm just entering my third turn Here's Counterspell. Uh, a little late, and even then I would have to hold up everything because I could cast the island, I would still have to hold up everything in order to get use out of it. Now keep in mind, like I said, this is the second second game of this match. So in my sideboard, which I don't keep in the main board, is a lot of bounce. I believe I brought in uh, both copies of Snap, uh, both copies of um, uh, Mana War, I believe I brought in the two copies of pacifism that I have. I didn't draw any of that, but still I have all that in the deck and it's still not going to save me with this game because their the aggression is just insane with their, with their deck. So I play the Island out because what the hell else am I going to do? And I <laughs> get the storm blade out, but here's the thing. I am dead no matter what uh, I do. I mean, we have one Island up so we can maybe bluff that we have something that can somehow stop them from killing us but uh, no matter what i block i'm going to end up taking because if i block the Karen feeder uh the Karen feeder will sacrifice itself and then the mortician beetle gets an extra counter so then that goes up to four so then i'm still taking eight so i know i'm dead we're just going to sort of play this out and, and i'll show you <laughs> what they're going to do here i decide you know i'm just going to block the uh the wolf because at least I'll, I'll get to kill the wolf even though the wolf has trample and i'm still gonna die and they're like no no, no we're not gonna give you the satisfaction we're gonna have the wolf go out on our terms and they sack it and uh still do lethal to me because they get you know two four fours now so um yeah we get crushed we get absolutely crushed now what i took away from this game and as well to the the uh third game in this match pretty much went the same sort of way and they had a bit of a slower start in their third game of this match this deck is not the best against super aggressive decks like this. Now it worked well against an impact tremors type deck, but that's a whole other kettle of fish because I was still able to sort of catch up. But in this one, because of the, the lands that are coming in tapped and because of not being able to get like a, an Esper Stormblade out on right on turn two, um, and then having a bunch of cards, which really didn't do me any good, uh, because it's still turn four and I'm dead. So, I need to figure out 
some sort of method of dealing with an aggressive deck like this. And I will get into that in the postmortem as to what sort of ideas I have, and then you guys can share hopefully your ideas with me in the comment section. However, let's move on to the fourth game and the second loss that I'm going to be showing you. Okay, now this is actually going to be the third game of this match, and I have won one and lost one, obviously, otherwise we wouldn't have gone to a third game in the match. And my opening hand is... is pretty decent. I'm going to be able to get a uh, Zealous Guardian 1 and 2 out. I mean, I'd rather have a beefier creature. We don't have any of the enchantment buffs. We do have Shielding Plaques, which I can sort of prep one of these creatures with and draw an extra card. Not to spoil anything, because you're going to see it in a second. Our opponent is playing the sort of, um, I, I refer to it just as the Bogle deck. I'm not sure how you guys refer to it. It's the enchantment heavy hexproof deck, where it's a bunch of small hexproof creatures that they just put enchantment and enchantment and enchantment on and buff them up, making it impossible to target their creatures with a removal. So this deck, even though it was the uh, third game of the match, there wasn't much I could really bring in for my sideboard to counteract it. The only thing I could really do, because sideboard has bounce, um, mana war, snap, a pacifism, all things that need to target creatures in order to be effective. So I believe I just ended up, even though they don't have any red in this deck, I believe I brought in pretty much any creature other than Mana War from my deck or from my sideboard into the main deck to sort of like compensate and just maybe get more creatures out there. So with their deck, I'm actually glad to have two Zealous Guardians because at least I'm going to have some creatures on the board that can maybe at, at worst just act as chump blockers early on to sort of slow down their aggression. You'll see how well this works for us. So they keep their opening hand and they start off with abundant growth. So this is I've I've seen this in, in the previous games. They're they're already starting off pretty good because they have the enchantments that sort of play off how many other enchantments you have in your in uh, on the board as well too. But now we have the tranquil cove, which is great because I can need every bit of life I can get in this game. I I don't even bother to, like waiting to flash out the zealous guardian. I'm just gonna bring it out because they don't really have much in the way of removal in this deck. They don't need it. It's just it's just pure aggression. It, it's it's similar to an infect deck. It's like an infect deck without needing infect even because they can just sort of like overrun with these these creatures that you can't target and get rid of so here we go and this is a perfect example of one um the ledge walker which can't be blocked except by creatures with flying so we are lucky in the sense with this deck we actually have creatures that can block this because uh we have creatures with flying not the zealous guardians of course but we do have creatures that can block this and it's got hexproof which just makes it a pain in the butt so they're casting that we get to swing in with the Zealous Guardian for free because there's no way they're blocking the Zealous Guardian with this. And we can't block this, so there's no point in me holding it back. I'm just going to go swing in with the Zealous Guardian. So here I tap to bring out the other Zealous Guardian and then bring out one of the, the Chanceries just so that I can get a stronger mana base going. Um, luckily, we have two lands that don't come into play tapped. We have another Chancery for a little bit later on to pump up our mana base. So once again, it's it's not the best opening hand because I would like a few more creatures and some more beneficial enchantments, but it's also not the worst uh, uh, opening hand that we can have. We have a, a land that we can then cycle. Um, so, so yeah, once again, I wouldn't be super disappointed with this hand playing any other deck, but with this deck, it's, it's just not going to be enough in the end. So they have the Cartouche of Solidarity, which I'm actually kind of happy about because even though it creates a 1-1, one, one, it's going to create a 1-1 one, one that's not hexproof. So I am going to be able to target this other one at least if I do get some of my removal. So it makes this a 2-2 two, two first strike, but I couldn't block it anyway, so I don't really care. And they're not going to keep it back as a blocker. Um, then they bring out the Bogle. So another one of the, the hexproof creatures. And um, yeah, things are not going our way. They're going to swing for two points of damage. So now it's our turn. Now we get lucky. Steal the Godhead. It's one of the best cards that we could possibly have drawn at this point. So I'm thinking, okay, maybe, maybe I can pull this out because, excuse me, I'll be able to start gaining back some of the life and maybe I'll be able to build up my creatures before they can build up their creatures. Granted, Zealous Guardian is the worst creature in the deck for Steel Godhead other than like Muldrifter or something like that. But still, it's going to make it a 3-3 unblockable lifelinker. So I can't be too sad about that. So moving on, I go ahead and I cast Steel of the Godhead on it. And I'm going to swing in feeling pretty good about myself. And then I find out something that they sideboarded in. Natural State. So destroy target artifact or enchantment with converted mana cost. Three or less. So... Yeah, not feeling so great about myself anymore. Immediately feeling a lot worse. So I do one point of damage, don't gain any life, as opposed to three points and gaining three life back. So <laughs> they have ethereal armor. 
Um, which, you know, sucks for us. Uh, Enchanted Creature gets plus one, plus one for each enchantment you control, and it has first strike. It already has first strike, but whatever. So this is now going to immediately get buffed up to a 5-5 five five for a striker that I can't block with any of the creatures I have because none of them have flying. Now, I'm not sure if it's in this game. I think it's in this game. I'm going to wait a couple seconds and find out. They swing in with the, the guy with Vigilance. Uh, I decide to block the Bogle because I'm going to definitely want to take out the Hexproof creature. Uh, this, in my opinion, I mean, even if they had something to pump this up, I didn't care. It's still the best chance I had or will have to actually take out the Slippery Bogle. So I do end up blocking it, and they don't have anything, so it dies. So in my mind, that was that was a surprising play from them, but, you know, whatever. It, it, it worked out just fine. Now, the next surprising play, <laughs> not surprising play, they have Slippery Bogle. Um, we do get one of our Stormblades. Sorry, I, I was thinking of uh, about a turn ahead, they do something which surprises me as well, too. Esper Stormblade. So that's good for us, uh, because it means we get to another creature out on the board. So I cycle the planes, uh, get a Mole Drifter, so I know I'm going to be able to get some more card draw. So I'm still not thinking we're totally, totally screwed. And the great thing about Esper Stormblade here is it's got flying. So at, at the very least, I can slow them down by chump blocking this and not necessarily have to take five next turn. Still not doing great. Not doing great at all. And we bring another Chancery, so... So here's where things get worse. Okay, so... I. I was misremembering, and they've they've learned from their mistake, because in the uh, previous game, one of the games that I believe that I won, they ended up pumping up the warrior token with uh, things like ethereal armor, and, and um, armadillo cloak is another card that they run in this deck. And I was thrilled when I saw that, because I can target the warrior. I can't target the slippery bogle, and I can't target the ledge walker. So this is not the game where they made that mistake. Um, this is the game where they just stop my butt. So now they have a 6-6 six, six first striker and a 5-5 five, five first striker, neither of which that I can target. Not that I have anything that can target them at this point. And they swing them with, with both. Uh, they do hold back the warrior. They didn't really have to, but I guess they just didn't want, you know, the warrior just to get eaten for no reason. Um, and they swing in. So here, I could go down to 1 if I take everything, but uh, I decide, you know, I'm not going to go down to 1. I'm going to go down to 6 instead. So there's still a chance that I can I can make it out of uh, this alive if I catch something like Steel the Godhead. Uh, they catch they they land another. Now they're completely out. They're there as uh, the guy from uh, uh, Propaganda says like they're hellbent, which it's 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 I know I know he didn't create that term, but he uses it a lot. I always refer to it as being a top deck mode, but uh, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Now there's Storm Stormcaller's Boon, which. I'm hoping <laughs> brings me Steel the Godhead, and even then, I don't think that's going to matter. Uh, but it is still a multicolored permanent, so it's going to uh, trigger Esper Stormblade. I get, do get another Esper Stormblade out, so now I have two flyers, and um, that are essentially just going to act as chump blockers. I bring the Cove out to give myself a bit of extra health. It's really not going to help. So they go ahead and swing in with both, and why wouldn't they swing in with the other things? But a uh, little bit of indecision there, but they decide. You know, he's not going to block these ones anyways. So instead, I block um, this, and I believe I block the other Hexproof creature. Do I? Yeah, I do block the other Hexproof creature. So I am taking six here. So I'm down to one. So I'm pretty much dead any anyway next turn. And they catch another scout, because why wouldn't they? So uh, they don't need it. Uh, we get preordained, and nothing here. So I'm going to, you know, see what we have. It's not going to matter. I grab the Sure Blade. I, I think just out of sheer desperation, I'm like, do I have any answers left in this deck? And no, because I got a Counterspell and an Oblivion Ring, which um, I only kept in. Now, this is one of the reasons why I do like Oblivion Ring, because Oblivion Ring, it, it doesn't have to target the creature. Instead, it could take out Ethereal Armor, which would make this, uh, put this from being a 5-5 to a 1-1 again. So even though I can't target something like um, the, the Slippery Bogle with the Oblivion Ring. Oblivion Ring still works against a deck like this. Not well enough, obviously, to have me win the game in the end, but still. And there's Counterspell, which, as I've mentioned several times before, I'm questioning whether to keep in this deck or not. So that was another loss. A different type of aggressive deck, but still an aggressive deck that I lost to. So this deck is fairly different, though, than like the uh, Aristocrat-style deck, but it's still a deck that I'm going to have, I'm pretty sure, a continual problem with if this deck stays exactly the way that I have it now. Okay, now based on the decks that I played against in those games, there are certain things that I'm thinking of changing with the deck. First of all, uh, Counterspell. 
I'd hate to see it go, so instead of taking it out, I may just cut it back to two copies and put two remove souls or maybe negates in instead. Um, and then on top of that, I'm thinking of actually sort of changing my mana base and maybe taking out two of the planes and putting in two more islands. I rarely run into a situation where I don't have the white mana I need. However, because this uh, counter spell is the only double blue spell that I have, I think taking out two planes and putting in two more islands might be the way to go. Now, the next problem I have is with super, super aggressive decks. There is a card that I'm thinking of adding in either to the main board or possibly at least just a, at least a couple copies to the sideboard. And that card is Prismatic Strands. Now, it is two and one white for an instant. Prevent all damage that sources of the color of your choice would deal this turn. It's also got flashback, tap, and untapped white creature you control. And remember, if it's something like the Zealous Guardian, which is both blue and white, it still counts as a white creature. Now, I do ha I have one copy of this so far. It's a foil copy, but oddly enough, the foil copy was cheaper than the non-foil copy. I am going to pick up a playset. This card for a common, and I'm kicking myself because I know at one point I used to have so many copies of this card because I started playing Magic Online around Judgment. Um, it's, it's about two tickets a card, which is tough to swallow because one of the things that I think a lot of people like pop or like with Popper is the fact that a lot of Popper cards are cheap and not that two tickets is like, you know, crazy expensive. It's more than I usually like to pay for a Popper card. So uh, I am though going to probably pick up a play set of this card because I have seen this card used to good effect in other people's decks and i think this card might help with uh against super aggressive decks like the aristocrats or the bogle deck the bogle enchantment deck especially in decks like that where with the the enchantment deck where i can't target the creatures with hex proof so allowing them to swing in and just use prismatic strands and then flash it back from the graveyard this might be an answer to those decks that buy me the time that i need to get this deck going because like i said it's not a super super quick aggressive deck but once it can sort of get going by turn three sometimes turn four you can usually sort of make it for lost ground with the life gain and some other stuff so Prismatic Strands might be a good addition to this deck. As well, too, something to consider is some more enchantment hate in this deck. I'm not sure, you know, I don't want to I don't want to play or, or push this deck too much towards just um, doing better against one particular matchup like the the Bogle deck or something like that. So I don't want to like load it up with cards that will only be useful against that deck. You want to try to have it as multi purpose as possible. But enchantments are not uncommon, especially in poppers. So I think a little bit of enchantment hate might do this deck good. Also, maybe Oromancer. I mentioned this in the deck tech as a possible uh, possible card you might want to add. It may be something that I want to add in so that I can get uh, something like Steel of the Godhead back from the graveyard. Though, honestly, I didn't really run into a whole lot of situations. Usually it's after they've had a chance to sideboard that I run into more of the enchantment hate. But I haven't run into so much enchantment hate yet that Oromancer to me seems like something that I need in this deck, but it is still a possibility, but definitely uh, prismatic strands. How about you guys though? Now that you guys, if you have, have a chance to check out the deck tech, you've been able to see some of the games. Uh, I realize I've probably breezed through some of the games a lot quicker. Maybe in the future, when I sort of do these supplementals to the, the decks or the deck techs, uh, I'll, I'll take you through an entire match or something like that. But I wanted to try to to show as many different variations of decks that I played against and how this deck worked against them as possible. However, based on what you guys saw, please let me know anything that you think might improve this deck. I know some of you did that with the deck tech itself or in the comment section of the deck tech itself, but please let me know anything that you saw that maybe I didn't that uh, could be improved other than the person running the deck. And uh, let me know in the comment section below because I'd love to be able to improve this deck. However, that is it for this video. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to contact or follow us on Twitter, it is at TV, or you can contact and follow me directly on Twitter at Geek Tragedy. And with all that said, take care, everyone. Thank you so much for liking and subscribing. It means a lot to us here. May all your decks go undefeated, and I'll see you all very soon.